This video continues our series on invertebrate diversity. We've been working our way up through all the different types of animals and we're now to the point where we need to talk about arthropods. Well, So what are arthropods? There's a great deal of arthropod diversity. They include all the insects, all the crustacea, the spiders, the arachnids, scorpions and ticks, centipedes and millipedes. In fact, it's the largest phylum in the animal kingdom. So what defines arthropods? What are the characteristics? Well, we know that all arthropods have jointed appendages. In fact, the word arthropod means jointed appendages. Think about it. Arthroscopic surgery, or arthritis, is an inflammation of your joints. Arthro means joints. Poda, or pod, means, in this case, appendages, jointed appendages. All arthropods have very distinct body segmentation and arthropods have an external skeleton made of a carbohydrate called chitin. That's why it crunches when you step on a bug. This exoskeleton is also what you peel when you peel shrimp or what you crack when you, crab, cra when you uh, crack crab legs. Those are the three kind of defining characteristics of this group. But what about other characteristics? Let's think about these other characteristics and how they may actually um, lead to the fact that the arthropods are our largest group in the animal kingdom. One, Arthropods are highly modal. They move about. So if the environment in their area turns bad and, or uh, doesn't favor them, they can move. They have fast reproduction. They can reproduce quickly and in large numbers. They have well-developed sensory systems which allow them to uh, respond to, their, to changes in their environment. And many of the arthropods exhibit pretty complex social behaviors. Another characteristic that all arthropods share that we're going to talk about in terms of uh, significance is that they have an incomplete circulatory system. Now we can stop there for a moment and ask ourselves a question about the efficiency of an incomplete circulatory system compared to a complete circulatory system uh, like we might have seen in the annelids and like we're going to see uh, later. How does an incomplete circulatory system limit an organism? To understand that we have to remind ourselves what circulatory systems are doing they're delivering materials throughout the body hopefully in an efficient manner but is an incomplete circulatory system efficient well turns out it depends and I'm gonna ask you in class what it depends upon so I want you to think about it under what conditions is an incomplete circulatory system efficient enough I'll give you a hint there's either one of two issues now let's go back and talk the, about the internal skeleton again because this is the first time in our uh, trek through uh, animals that we've seen a skeletal system. So we need to talk about the advantages of having a skeletal system at all. So let's think about it. What are the advantages? Stop the video now and see if you can come up with at least three advantages to having an exoskeleton. Well, look right here. What is this muscle doing? Well, it's attaching to the exoskeleton. So the idea is that an exoskeleton provides a site for muscle attachment. It gives muscle something to pull against. What else did you come up with? How about this one? Can having an exoskeleton prevent desiccation? Prevent you losing your water? And is that important for a terrestrial insect? How about a, a marine uh, arthropod where the salty water may be more hypertonic than their insides so they could be losing water to their environment? And finally, physical protection of course. We can see where an exoskeleton basically provides armor for the organism. But it turns out there's a downside. There's some disadvantages to having an exoskeleton. Can you think of any? Stop the video and write down and see if you can come up with any disadvantages of an exoskeleton. I thought of two. What if you want to grow? How do you grow with this outside casing around you? Well, it turns out that arthropods have to molt or shed their exoskeleton in order to grow. You can see that happening here. What else is a disadvantage to having an exoskeleton? Well, the other thing I thought of was it's heavy. Carrying around this uh, heavy armor is difficult. Now, this turns out to be much more of a problem for 
uh, terrestrial orthopods than aquatic because in the water the weight isn't as much of an issue and if you think about it where do you see the larger orthopods like a giant uh, crab or, or lobster you'd see them in the water where the water is carrying that weight so this heavy exoskeleton on some level restricts size now I'm going to ask another interesting question that relates to this issue this weight issue but also this issue think about this for a second can this happen? What about this? When you come to class next, I'm going to ask you to explain to me, give me two valid reasons why I don't have to worry about this happening to me. See what you come up with. In what ways do we understand how physiology could prevent orthopods from ever getting to this type of size? Let's move on while you think of that. When within the phylum Arthropoda, we have two subphyla, and the division is based upon the type of mouthparts. We have the chelicerata and the mandibulata. The chelicerata have pincers. They have mouthparts that uh, work in this direction and this direction. Let's contrast that to the mandibulates that have jaws, mouth parts that work in this direction and this direction. So this basic difference in mouth structure is the um, is how we divide these two subphyla, whoops, wrong button, the chelicerata and mandibulata. The chelicerata include all the spiders, the arachnids, but also mites, ticks, scorpions, and horseshoe crabs. And be careful of horseshoe crabs because they're not crabs, because crabs belong over here under the mandibulates that include insects, crustacea, the centipedes, the chilopoda, and the millipedes, the diplopoda. So of these different groups within the chelicerata, the three classes that we're going to focus in on are the arachnids. We're going to let the arachnids kind of represent all chelicerates in terms of what we study. And then we'll focus on insects and crustacea under the mandibulata. So before we start talking about these specific classes, let's do a quick run through of what we know about arthropods in general. We said that arthropods are the largest uh, phylum in the animal kingdom, that the word arthropoda means jointed appendages, that we have two subphyla, the chelicerates and the mandibulates, and the difference is based upon the mouth structure. We said that on the, for the most part, the orthopods are fairly modal and show a highly developed, uh, some show a highly developed social behaviors. Um, we see a very distinctive segmentation in orthopods. It may differ from group to group, but these different body segments will have specialized uh, functions. We'll talk about that more as we get into the, the different groups. Uh, we have highly cephalized animals here, very distinct heads with a concentration of sensory and feeding structures. And from the animals we've seen so far, we will see the most complex nervous system to date uh, outside the, the octopus, possibly. Um, so we'll see some well-developed nervous systems, and that's going to make sense if you think about the, the activity level and the amount of movement that orthopods do. You're going to need a complex brain to coordinate things as complicated as flight. Uh, when we talk about the digestive system, it's going to vary from the group to group. Uh, the same with the gas exchange, but we will see some different gas exchange systems uh, and organs that we haven't seen before. Uh, we're going to again talk about the significance of this incomplete circulatory system, and we'll briefly talk about some structures that help us get rid of metabolic waste, the excretion organs. Uh, which are the corollaries in our bodies to what we would have would be uh, kidneys for this. So we'll see what uh, crustacea and uh, insects and arachnids have as far as getting rid of their nitrogenous waste. And of course we said that the one of the defining characteristics of this group is that they have a hard exoskeleton made out of the carbohydrate chitin. Before we end, I want to come back to this question that I asked before and maybe give you a few more hints as to whether, whether or not I should be afraid that this could ever happen to me. So the first question is, can you be large with an incomplete circulatory system? I don't know. How about, could you be very active with an open or incomplete circulatory system? Well, what about could you be both large and very active with an open or incomplete circulatory system? And do you see any extremely large arthropods outside of water? 
Why or why not? That should give you all the clues you need to answer that question. In part two of this video, we're going to look at the specifics of crustacea, arachnids, and insects. So be sure to come back for part two.